For a people who've been used to ruling themselves, the rationale for paying taxes, direct taxes, levied by the parliament and not by their local legislatures, taxation without representation, it's a form of tyranny. And this is Our American Stories, the show where America is the star and the American people. Up next, another story from our series about us, the story of America. Here to tell it is Hillsdale College professor Bill McClay. At the conclusion of the French and Indian War, one thing was abundantly clear. The continent was Britain's for the taking, not the French or Spanish. But with victory came division, change, and events in the colonies that would forever shape our character. Let's get to Episode 4, The Roots of Revolution. Take it away, Bill. In the end, the the British win. The Treaty of Paris settles the fate of North America. It would be British North America. Americans were very grateful, and rightly so, but the British Prime Minister threw in a lot of money to win the battle, doubling the national debt, imagine that. There's a reasonable view on the British side. The colonies ought to be paying part of the freight for their own protection. That does not seem crazy, does it? I mean, it doesn't to me, but... For a people who'd been used to ruling themselves, the rationale for paying taxes, direct taxes, levied by the parliament and not by their local legislatures, taxation without representation, it's a form of tyranny. That's a point of view that also makes a lot of sense. If you're used to ruling yourself, you've been ruling yourself if you're Massachusetts for 150 years, so sure. Taxation without representation looks a whole lot like tyranny. There are other things, something different, something new going on culturally. There was spiritual forces at work that contribute to the idea the residents of North America were Americans. The Great Awakening, it's a movement of evangelistic, revivalistic, religious fervor that sweeps up and down the coastline had an enormous effect. Ministers call the people to renewal of their faith, giving these open air sermons that were not denominational in character. They weren't arguing for any particular ism. They were arguing for a spiritual renewal, for rededication to God and Christ. And they attracted many, many people. Revivalists like George Whitfield, his voice could be heard (laughs) across many city blocks. Benjamin Franklin went to hear him. Benjamin Franklin was sort of a skeptic about religion, but he he ended up emptying his pocket (laughs) because he was so impressed. But what this did, the Great Awakening, is it placed on the individual person much of the weight for their religious well-being. You You had to make a decision for Christ, and you had to do it individually. Conversion was an individual thing. It wasn't something that could be vouchsafed by the church giving you uh, the sacrament to eat or by some other work of the church as an institutional body. It was very much an individualistic thing. This is very different from the approach of the pilgrims and Puritans. There was no need for a mediator between the individual and God. So another element of the culture, which is very different. I won't say that it's opposed, but it was very different, was the spread of the Enlightenment. America was a perfect place for the Enlightenment to take root. It was 
a place where custom and tradition and the authority of tradition were much less entrenched than anywhere in Europe. We were making it up as we were going along. We were trying out our utopian experiments and adapting them. And the Enlightenment really empowers the individual to decide cases for himself on the basis of reason. We all possess reason. Reason is actually the single most important commonality that all of us have. That also plays upon and takes advantage of the weakness of traditional authority in America. America was nature's nation. In France, let's say, the Enlightenment had to compete with the Catholic Church, which was a very wealthy and entrenched and established church, established church. So you had to fight all that to be able to sort of pursue the Enlightenment. In America, there was nothing like that. There was no established church, no established religion. There wasn't even a very conception of America. So the Enlightenment and the Great Awakening, these two seemingly very different, but complementary. One, the emotionalism and fervor. The other, a devotion to reason. These two things, took root here, and they contribute to a sense of Americanness. The Great Awakening, especially because it was an event that took place through all of the colonies. Everywhere you went, George Whitfield was there with his enormous voice and his appeal to the sentiments of his listeners, not to church doctrine. This was especially appealing to the less educated people who didn't quite have the uh, educational background to be attracted to the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was a movement of the elites, for sure. But there is this commonality of an appeal to the individual in both cases. And that ends up being very American, too. So there's not a lot of regard for establishment orthodoxies of any kind, social, political, religious, this kind of turbulence a very creative turbulence in American life is, I think, something that still lingers with us today. That's